Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. My name is Claire Haley and I am the Author Talks Coordinator here at Atlanta History Center. I am absolutely thrilled to be welcoming you tonight uh, for our first Author Talk of the summer, first June Author Talk. Um, we're so excited to be welcoming Lee Martin this evening to discuss his newest book, Gone the Hard Road and he will be in conversation with Jessica Handler. So don't forget, you can purchase a copy of Lee's book tonight from our official bookseller, Acapella Books. And shortly, I will post a link to do that in the chat. So we highly encourage you to support your local independent bookstore and to support Lee and purchase that from Acapella. Now, during uh, the conversation this evening, if you think of questions, we highly encourage those. Please submit them using the Q&A. And Jessica will weave those into the conversation as they go. So really quick introduction for our two guests this evening, then I'm gonna turn it over to them. Lee Martin is the author of many novels, including The Bright Forever, a finalist for the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. He is also the author of Yours, Gene, The Mutual UFO Network, and Late One Night, among others. His fiction and nonfiction have appeared in such places such as Harper's Creative Nonfiction and The Best American Essays. Winner of the Mary McCarthy Prize in Short Fiction, the 2006 Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching, the Fellowships for the National Endowment for the Arts and the Ohio Art Arts Council. Martin teaches an MFA program at The Ohio State University, where he is a College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor. And he is in conversation tonight with Jessica Handler. Jessica is the author of The Magnetic Girl, an indie next selection, Wall Street Journal Spring 19 pick, Bitter Southerner Summer 19 pick, an SIBA Okra pick, and we also hosted her um, at the Margaret Mitchell House for that release. She is the author of the nonfiction books Braving the Fire, A Guide to Writing About Grief, and Invisible Sisters, a memoir, which is named one of the 25 books all Georgians should read in Atlanta Magazine's Best Memoir of 2009. Jessica writes essays and nonfiction features that have appeared on NPR in Tin House, Drunken Boat, Full Grown People, Brevity, The Bitter Southerner, Electric Literature, Newsweek, The Washington Post, and more magazine. She's a lecturer in English at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta and teaches internationally on writing craft. So Jessica and Lee, we are thrilled to be welcoming you this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Lee. I'm glad to see you. Um, what I want to do tonight is ask you to start us off with a short reading from Gone the Hard Road, and then we will talk about it. I would be happy to do that, uh, Jessica. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Uh, thank you, as always, for, um, for everything you do to support writers. Uh, I love that. Uh, Claire, thank you so much, and uh, great thanks to the Atlanta uh, History Center for hosting this event. Um, yeah, I'm going to read a little bit from Gone the Hard Road, um, just to kind of start off the conversation. Uh, I guess there are a few things that you should probably know um, before I do this reading, and it's going to be very, very brief. Um, but you need to know that I grew up in a very rural area of southeastern Illinois. Um, when I was born, we lived on an 80 acre farm and my parents were older parents when I was born. I was, I was not meant to come along. I was a surprise baby. My mother was 45 when I was born. My father was 42. Um, as I said, we lived out there in the country um, on these gravel roads. Uh, the gravel roads eventually led to a paved road uh, which we called the slab or the blacktop or the hard road. And so if you were gone the hard road, you were going somewhere other than those gravel roads out there in the country. So I'm going to read just a brief section. Oh, the other thing you need to know is that um, if you don't already know this from my other work, um, when I was a little over a year old, my father lost both of his hands in a farming accident um, and became a very angry man. So this is a little bit from the opening of Gone the Hard Road. After my father was dead, my mother told me the story of the day they learned she was pregnant. They got the news in Doc Stoll's office. And the first thing my father said to the good doctor was, can you get rid of it? I've written about this moment before, the moment when my father, 
concern for my mother's health at her advanced age for childbearing, ask Doc Stoll if he could perform an abortion. I imagine that question hanging in the air of the office, my father waiting for Doc Stoll's response. I keep thinking about those few seconds when it was possible that Doc Stoll might say yes, and then I wouldn't exist. Wouldn't have been the son of Roy and Beulah Martin from rural Route 1, Sumner, Illinois. Wouldn't have had the 64 years I've now had to know pleasure and joy and injury and suffering. Wouldn't have had this life. I can't get the thought out of my head that there were those few seconds when it was possible that my parents would have been rid of me. But Doc Stoll said no, no indeed, he couldn't do that. This baby, I imagine him saying in his gruff voice, will get born and you'll just have to deal with that. No matter how far I've come from the country kid I was, I can never forget the family we were. My kind mother who loved books, my wounded father, whose intense love often got swallowed up inside his rage, and me, the only child, eager to escape my life and to immerse myself in someone else's story. Whenever we drove the hard road, I often found myself imagining all the places that lay beyond it and wondering if, given the chance, I might someday see them, might move beyond those gravel roads, might leave behind me the dust in the fields, might finally know exactly where I belonged. I fell in love with books and the life of the imagination at an early age. And because of that, the world opened to me. I can still see myself sitting beside my mother in Doc Stowell's waiting room, a Highlights for Children magazine open between us. She holds one side of it, I hold the other. Some of my fondest memories from childhood are the times we spent alone together, safely away from my father's temper. She helps me with the words I don't know. We do the puzzles, we find the hidden pictures, and we read the jokes. Sometimes she reads a story to me. Her voice is soft, and I want to listen to it forever. I like to think she believes her life has turned out exactly how she always wanted it to be. Always wanted to be a mother. Always wanted me, her son. And was glad that day when Doc Stoll said no, he couldn't get rid of it. This baby would have to be born. Read another one, I say to her when she finishes a story. And she does my kind and patient mother. I can still hear her. All right, she says. Then she turns the page and we begin. That is so beautiful. Thank you. I'm oh, applauding. Thank you. It yeah. is just, yeah, I just love it. Um, I wanna start by asking you this. And I want to tell the attendees that if you, as you have questions or comments, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and I'll sort of dip in and out and integrate them into the conversation. So don't wait till the end. If something occurs to you, throw it in there and I'll grab it. Um, Gone the Hard Road is the story of your mother, of Beulah Martin, and her endurance and her sacrifice. But it's also the story of you as a child and, and going into um, being a, an adult. How do we write memoir about another person? How do we write memoir about another person? In other words, how do we how do we represent their lives on yeah. the page, right? Right. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, you know, I think I think uh, I think a key to doing this is to um, is to have a lot of empathy for the person you're writing about, um, in the respect of um, trying to understand what it was like for them to have the life they had. Um, so for instance, in writing about my father after his accident, um, you know, I had to, I had to really make the effort to, 
understand the sources of his anger, of his temper. Um, so artifacts become important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I have, um, I wish I had it right here at hand, so to speak, but I don't. But I have um, a hammer that's about, it's about this long uh, that my father could, he could unscrew one of his hooks from the plastic holster that his um, arms would slip down into. He could unscrew that and then screw this hammer into the end of the holster and use it as, as the tool it was meant to be used, as it was meant to be used. And just having that near me when I write, um, feeling the weight of it causes me to understand what it must have been like for my father to have carried the weight of those prostheses um, most of his life after his accident. Um, other artifacts like family photographs. Um, uh, I have a, an old uh, Farm Bureau pamphlet that my father scribbled on before he lost his hands so I can actually see his handwriting before uh, the accident. But then I also have things from my mother as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I have the last, she would have called it her pocketbook. Uh, I would call it her purse, but she would have called it a pocketbook. I have the last one she ever owned. And uh, this was when she was in the nursing home toward the end of her life. And inside that is her wallet, the last wallet she carried. And I can see what she carried, um, royal trading stamps, um, coupons for a discounted sandwich at a restaurant for <laughs> brothers, uh, things like that. And then there was like a, a lace handkerchief from the Wisconsin Dells. Um, and, and all these things, these artifacts become really important to me um, when I try to imagine and write about uh, mm -hmm. these people's lives um, who never gave me permission to do so. <laughs> And you're writing about them from your perspective. You're not writing ab about them as them. So in writing a memoir about another person, you stay in the position of you are Lee. Yeah, right. And so even if, even if I cue my reader that um, I'm going to imagine something from my mother's point of view, for instance, maybe I'm going to imagine the story of their meeting and falling in love. I'm going to do that from my mother's point of view. Even when I do that, when I say to the reader, you know, let's say it was a rainy evening mm -hmm. and this happened, this happened, this happened, that's filtering through me. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always at the center. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's just such an interesting, I, I don't want to call it a trick, but there's, it's almost like, uh, like changing your focus on a camera or on a lens. You told me years ago when I interviewed you for Braving the Fire that I'm going to quote you back to yourself here. Writing nonfiction begins with curiosity, contradiction, confusion, and then the writer has somewhere to go. So right. what I want to ask you is, what is the curiosity that led to writing Gone the Hard Road? Well, one of the major curiosities that led to the writing of this book was um, the question of how my mother was able um, to, as you say, endure the, um, you know, some of the really hard spots of uh, our life after my father's accident and how she was also able to um, give me the gift of reading literature, uh, the life of the imagination, the creative life. Uh, I'd written so much about my father trying to understand his story this time I wanted to understand how my mother um, was able to maintain her own sense of self within a marriage to a man who was a very strong personality um, and a person whose anger often overshadowed everything around us. Um, yeah, that was, that was my curiosity. How, you know, the question of what it was like to be my mother and how she was able um, how she was able to be a mother at the age of 45 and to put up with a lot of my nonsense through my rebellious teenage years. 
We're going to talk about some of that nonsense uh, in just a minute. And, you know, now that we're adults, we can call it nonsense. Back then, for both of us, it was like, this is serious. Um, we have a question or a comment. Roy Bentley uh, says hi, and then he loved the book. And he says, mostly for its great empathy, which should not be minimized. And I agree. So Roy's question is, how have you maintained that level of compassion for the human community? Hey, Roy Bentley, glad, glad to, to have you on board tonight. And thanks for that question. Um, you know, I, I'm of a firm belief that every time I sit down to write, um, I'm trying to understand something about uh, human behavior that I haven't quite fully understood before. And I don't think I ever fully understand anything about human behavior. So every, every trip to the page is an attempt uh, to try to capture something, if only temporarily, that uh, makes sense to me. Um, and so to do that, one thing I always have to remind myself is to never judge the people I'm writing about to never really judge myself either, except I do kind of hold myself to the fire quite a bit when I write, but I don't want to judge anyone. I just want to try to understand the sources of their behaviors. Uh, and, and I want to understand those contradictions that make up character. Um, and to do that, I sort of have to put myself in their shoes um, and, and feel what, it, what it's like for them, what it's like for them to have the lives that they have. So I guess it's just a matter of always staying curious um, and always having this attempt to uh, try to understand. Thank you. Yeah. Talking about your mother, there's a scene early in the memoir where your mother and father have a difference of opinion about her buying books for you. And I want you to tell us a little bit about that scene um, I'm thinking of like the it, books go behind a car uh, seat and also about the role of reading in your life. Oh, sure. Um, well, the scene that, that uh, Jessica is talking about, um, I don't know if anybody else remembers this, but uh, when I was a kid, there was something called Children's Classics. It was a book club and it operated the way book clubs do. You, um, you know, you got so many to start for a nominal fee and then I guess it was every month they would send you uh, um, a coupon. And if you wanted that book, you didn't do anything and they would send it to you. If you didn't want that book, you would send the coupon back declining it. I think you had to buy a certain number of books over the time of the membership. So my mom had enrolled me in this children's classics book club and I was getting books like uh, Booth Tarkington's Pinrod and Sam and uh, Captain's Courageous and uh, Kidnapped um, at the back of the North Wind. These are some of the titles I remember. But one day I was sitting in my father's pickup truck while waiting for him to do something out in the field. And um, he had behind the seat of the truck uh, these signal flares for if there was ever a breakdown on the road, right? And so they were these little flags with pieces of red cloth on them. And I thought they were the greatest things to play with. So I was feeling around back there for those. And what I pulled out was a box addressed to Master Lee Martin. That's the way they always used to send things to kids, right? They called you master. Uh, and it was a book from the, from the Children's Classic Book Club. And uh, my father had intercepted it at the mailbox and was planning to return it. Um, and... I remember my, my mother saying, no, we will not return this book. We'll keep this book. Um, my father was trying to save money and my mother was intent upon giving me, giving me the gift of books. And so reading, reading became very, very important to me. Um, it, was, it was sort of an isolated life on the farm. I was an only child, of course. I uh, had no siblings to play with. Uh, we had kids at neighboring farms, but they were at some distance. Uh, the closest farm had two kids that I played with. They were my, my constant playmates. But other than that, 
you had to sort of arrange play dates or you met kids at birthday parties or at vacation Bible school or something like that. And so um, books gave me companionship. And even though I didn't know it at the time, reading um, opened up other worlds to me. Yeah. Um, it made me aware of other places, other people, people unlike me, places unlike my own, and everything just sort of widened out at that point. And um, I don't know if my mom was aware of that. She surely must have been because she was a great reader herself. So she must have known that, um, you know, the world was getting larger for me as I began to read. And now, of course, there are studies that say that literature generates empathy. Reading literature generates empathy. Absolutely. Um, so Beulah might have been a little ahead of her time in knowing that. Two questions, Kathleen Kriske, and if I mispronounce her name, please let me know, I apologize. Kathleen asks, do you remember what book that was? Do I remember what book it was? I, yeah. Oh yeah, Kathy, I think it was, um, I think it was Kidnapped. It was either Kidnapped or Captain's Courageous, but I think it was Kidnapped, which makes a sort of uh, poetic irony, doesn't it, Kidnapped? <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. Gail O'Neill wants to know, she says, Lee, what did you conclude when trying to understand how your mother was able to withstand the fire of your dad's anger while ma maintaining her softness and grace? Yeah. What did you conclude about that? That's a really good question. Um, my mom was a woman of great faith. Um, she was never um, evangelical about her faith. It was something that was very private uh, to her, um, but it gave her, what I finally come to understand is it gave her a tremendous strength that was hidden beneath um, what most people considered a very meek um, forefront. Uh, my mother seemed to be very meek, but she, she was actually very fierce underneath all of that. And I think that was a direct result of the faith that she had. She, she always believed in the best of people. Um, she believed in the best parts of me, even when I was displaying all of the worst parts of me. Uh, and I, I think she believed the same about my father. Um, my uncle told me uh, after my father was dead, after my mother was dead too, that before the accident, my father had been a very sweet natured uh, person. And I can only imagine that uh, that, was, that was what first attracted my mother to him. And then after the accident, things uh, changed drastically. But I think it was that faith she had um, not only a Christian faith, but a faith in people in general that, that um, and I, I, I can just imagine this, this paid off for her and her teaching. Uh, she must have seen the worst of kids, but she must have always believed in the best of them. Yeah. We're getting such good questions in the Q&A. I just want to take my questions and just like throw them in the hallway. Um, we have a question here from um, Shiv Dutta. And again, if I mispronounce, um, I know you from Facebook, but I don't. I might mispronounce your name, so hi. Uh, says, Lee, I'm almost at the end of Gone the Hard Road. Awesome book, like your others. Would you have written this and some of your other books where you write about your father's anger if your parents were still alive? Oh, hi, Shiv. Thank you so much for that question. It's a really great question, and the answer is simple. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was talking about this at, at another event. I was talking about how I consider myself an accidental memoirist. I never intended to write memoir, um, but when I got my first teaching position, my first tenure track teaching position, they assigned me a graduate workshop in creative nonfiction. And I thought if I'm gonna teach people how to write this, I need to write some of it myself. I'd always thought of myself strictly as a fiction writer. And I'd published a book of stories, The Least You Need to Know, which were essentially stories about sons in difficult relationships with fathers. And so then I wrote a little essay called From Our House. It was the very first time I'd written directly about um, my father and his accident and the life it, it created for, for us. And something just opened up in me at that point. And I wrote maybe three more essays and I saw that I had a narrative arc and I surrendered and I wrote a memoir. 
uh, from our house. And um, so that was all written after both of my parents were gone. Um, and I don't imagine I would have written uh, that first memoir if they had still been alive. And um, yeah, so anyway, the answer, Shiv, is probably not. I probably would not have. But I will say, I will say this, that um, maybe I would have because eventually, eventually you have to claim your experience and you have to announce your experience if you want to get to the future. Um, if I hadn't written these memoirs, I think I would have been forever stuck in that past experience with the legacy of anger that my father left for me. Um, writing that first memoir allowed me to understand him better, to understand what his life was like for him. And at the same time, it allowed me to let go of a lot of the anger that I had carried with me um, from his, um, his anger. So maybe I would have at a certain point because I think, you know, you get to a certain point where you just, you just have to tell your story. On the subject of telling your story and claiming your experience, I want to talk a little bit about Goofus and Gallant. And <laughs> <laughs> Goofus and Gallant have pretty strong presence in um, Gone on the Hard Road. So what I want you to do is, I remember them, I was a Goofus fan, um, but if you would please tell us, some of us, who Goofus and Gallant were, and also why they mattered to you, and so maybe a Goofus moment. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Um, well, you remember from the little reading I did to start our conversation, there's a reference to a magazine called Highlights for Children, uh, which was a magazine that I always experienced in the doctor's waiting room or the dentist's waiting room. Um, and it's a magazine for children. It's a great, great magazine. Maybe some of you remember it from your own childhoods. Um, and it had all these great features like the timber toes, um, the, the, uh, the hidden objects where you would find upside down or turn sideways saws or oil cans or something like that in a landscape or, or something like that. Um, and then another big feature was Goofus and Gallant. So Goofus and Gallant were these two boys. Uh, as you might imagine, Goofus was always misbehaving and Gallant was always doing everything correctly. So if I remember correctly, they were like side-by-side -side panels. And the first one might say something like, Goofus is always writing in the margins of his library books. And then to the side, it would be Gallant never defaces a library book or something like that. So you were getting this uh, kind of moral instruction through uh, these cartoon panels. And um, so I do make reference to Goofus and Gallant um, in Gone the Hard Road. Um, I had plenty of Goofus moments. Um, I had plenty of Gallant moments, I think. Because, you know, I always felt like I was, I was balanced somewhere on what I thought was a very thin line between my, my mother's compassion and my father's cruelty. Uh, I was always trying to negotiate um, where my life was going to fall um, on that spectrum. Um, if you want an example of a of, oh, here's a great example. Of, you can uh, give a gallant moment too. I don't want to frame no, you as I, a good I was, gonna, I was gonna say, Jessica, this is a great example of kind of a simultaneous goofus and, and gallant moment. Go for um, it. All right, so when I was in grade school, um, there was a girl in my class, this would have been fourth grade, I think, named April Renevere. And she was the sweetest thing. Um, she was, she was, she was um, absolutely a gallant person. Um, but at the time I'm recalling, um, we had a hepatitis outbreak in our community. And so we couldn't share lunches. Uh, we couldn't uh, drink in out of the water fountain. Um, and we knew that April's father um, had been sick with hepatitis. And my teacher, Mrs. Malley, 
who, by the way, told me I had no imagination when I was in the fourth grade. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she would start every Monday uh, morning by asking us to tell stories of what we did over the weekend. And on this particular Monday morning, she asked April Renevere how her father was doing. Well, I remembered something I heard my parents talk about, about how serious hepatitis was. And I shot my hand up and Mrs. Malley said, yes. And I said, isn't it true, Mrs. Malley, that someone can die from hepatitis? And April Renevere threw herself over her desk, sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And Mrs. Malley was so angry with me because I had, I'd said that. And I immediately realized what a goofus moment a gallant attempt had turned into. And it was my first lesson or one of my first lessons in irony. Um, you, think, you think you're gonna get a particular result and you get something quite the opposite. So like, I guess that would be dramatic irony, right? You, Nicely you, done though, goofus and gallant. Nicely <laughs> done in your explanation there. It's like, so, you know, you are like your mother, you are a natural teacher. You have taught me, not officially, but you continue to teach me and you are a natural teacher and you explain in a very patient way in the text in Gone the Hard Road, um, how a riddle works and also kind of the nature of irony. Um, I was gonna say ironing. You can explain the nature of ironing to me if you'd like to as well. My mother would have been pleased with that. So how does teaching writing connect you with your mother? Well, um, I think I even write about this in the book. Um, I, was always, I was always fascinated with my mother's identity as a teacher. Um, for whatever reason in that part of the world at that time, uh, it was common for grade school teachers to marry farmers. Uh, that, was a, that was a very common occupational combination, the farmer and the, and the grade school teacher. And um, I was always tagging along with my mom when she went to school to uh, make preparations for the start of the school year. Um, she had to make bulletin board displays and I always got involved with that. One time I even, uh, I even told my mom I was gonna make up a test for her students. Uh, and it had all these ridiculous questions on it like how many stars are in the sky. And um, my mom said, okay, I'll take that and I'll give that to my students. And uh, of course, I don't, I don't think she really did, but she let me believe that I had some kind of role in her teaching. Um, and I guess as a result of that, I always wanted to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and there's not a day go, goes by that I'm, I'm not uh, well aware of how blessed I am to be able to do that. Um, so um, I think when I'm in the classroom, um, I'm, I don't think I'm really aware of it, but now that you've asked the question, it leads me to the belief that um, there is a connection between my mom and me through, through teaching. Um, it was what she did. Uh, it was who she was. And um, I've always said that writing is like that as well, that you know, writing is not just something I do. It's, it's, it's who I am, it's part of my identity, right? It's part of the way I interact with the world around me. It's part of the way I try to make sense of things. Writing, teaching, same thing. Um, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to make sense of a lot of things. And when I write, I'm trying to make sense of a lot of things. And um, I think my mom was, um, was always a very curious person uh, as far as inquisitive um, and interacting within the world, with the world uh, through her teaching. And, and I do the same thing. Those of you, I think a lot of people on the Q&A are already familiar with Lee's teaching and Lee's work, but just as an aside, um, if you follow me on Facebook or also Lee's website, which I think we could put in the chat, I think Claire can do that. 
you have a regular craft blog, right? Lee, where you put up information and prompts and things to think about. Yeah, I, I think it's um, <clears throat> every Monday morning I try to post a, a, a new entry. Uh, I remember when I started this website, my, my designer said, okay, you have to have a blog. And I said, no, I don't want a blog. He said, no, you gotta have a blog. That's the most important thing for your website. And I said, okay, I'll do a blog. And he says, what are you gonna call it? I thought, I, I don't know. Let's call it The Least You Need to Know. That was the title of my first book. Let's just call it The Least You Need to Know. Writing, editing, publishing, teaching, and other stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I've gotten now into the habit of every Sunday afternoon uh, doing a new blog uh, post. And then I post it on Monday morning. And it's basically craft oriented. Mm -hmm. um, I try to do writing exercises and I try to talk about um, craft elements that are coming up in discussion in class that you know I wanna think a little bit more deeply about. Um, and I've really come to love doing this blog. And I will say to the audience, if anyone, if anyone wants me to talk about anything in particular on my blog, uh, all you have to do is just let me know I'm always looking for new things to talk about. That's a good thing to know because I might, I kind of cheat a little bit sometimes with my lesson planning and you and a couple of other mentors and friends, sometimes I'll go to your work and go, oh, here's what we're going to do in my workshop on Tuesday. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so my students are benefiting from you. Claire has put uh, Lee's website in the chat. It's leemartinauthor.com and it, there's a live link in the chat. Um, Talk to us a little bit. Well, there's two things I want to ask you. One is you write fiction and nonfiction, long form and, and short story and essay. How is your approach or process different between the two genres, between fiction and nonfiction? Uh, process wise, I'm not sure that there's all that much difference to tell you the truth because I'm trying to tell a story um, both when I write fiction and when I write nonfiction. Um, I'm, I'm unabashedly narrative centered. Mm -hmm. um, I do write in the lyric form from time to time or um, flash nonfiction from time to time, but mainly I'm, an, I'm a storyteller. And so in that respect, my process is one of trying to um, create a shape for a story. Uh, and usually that's a shape that comes from um, a causal chain of events. Uh, so if I'm writing fiction, of course, I'm just creating all of this. Uh, how does this scene lead to this scene, et cetera, et cetera. When I write memoir, um, you know, I'm bound by uh, the limits of what actually happened, but I am able to look for that kind of cause and effect that creates a narrative arc. Uh, when I wrote my first memoir from our house, I, I was fortunate in the respect that, um, you know, I had spent the first um, eight years of my life on the farm going to this little two room school in the country. And then when I started the third grade, my mother took a teaching position in the suburbs of Chicago. And I was there from third grade until um, I started high school when we moved back downstate. And I was lucky that I had this sort of geographical uh, narrative arc. You know, the beginning being on the farm, the middle being in Oak Forest, Illinois, and then the, the latter part of the book taking place back downstate. Um, but even within that geography, I had to look for um, the major events of our life that uh, created a cause and effect, right? So, um, so yeah, process-wise, I don't think there's much difference. Now, intent-wise, I think there is. Uh, yeah. you know, my, my intention with fiction is to uh, create a world for uh, create a world for readers and populate it with characters who have some sort of dimension to them. Um, with nonfiction, my main intention is to, as you alluded to earlier, to think about what I don't know. Um, you know, I guess the main difference is in fiction, I try to write about what I know. And in nonfiction, I try to write about what I don't know. 
That's a really nice binary. I like that as a person who is nonfiction trained and my first two books were nonfiction and then I jumped into fiction and I'm still trying to figure out like what that switch is. And you're right, it's what I know versus what I don't know. I like that. So look, I just learned from you again. Anonymous attendee says, we tend to remember the negative more than we do the positive. How did you go about finding the stories of your mother's kindness within the difficulties of your father's anger? That's a good question. It's a great question. And I think it's so true that we do tend to um, remember the negative experiences. They stand out for us because, um, because they're, they're basically unresolved experiences. Uh, you know, we can't quite put them to rest. And so they, they, they keep knocking on our, our brains. They're the moments that I say that, you know, keep me up at three o'clock in the morning, um, thinking over what happened and how it might have been different, et cetera, et cetera. But those moments, those negative moments, they need something to stand with. Um, I could pretend that I know something about visual art, which I absolutely don't. And I could talk about foreground and background. Um, but I think what I really wanna say is that the negative events have more depth, have more dimension to them when they are alongside the more positive moments or the more joyful moments. Um, as writers, we're always trying to capture the texture of a lived life. And we know from experience that our lives are made up of both negative and positive things. Um, my father, for instance, in spite of his anger, was at heart a very generous man who was uh, always eager to help his neighbors. Um, I have fond memories of uh, listening to baseball games with him on Sunday afternoons. When it comes to my mother, um, you know, there's one place in the book where I tell the story of when she was in the nursing home toward the end of her life and she was she was suffering from dementia and I visit her, visited her one time and she told this story of how she had just gotten back from uh, spring training with the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, it was of course, a, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a bittersweet story because on one hand it was really sad that she literally believed she had been to spring training with the Cardinals. But on the other hand, it was really kind of sweet and endearing because it gave me all these images of my mother digging out low throws at first base and <laughs> and and covering uh, covering the uh, or flipping the ball to the pitcher uh, on ground balls. Um, but anyway, that was that was a moment that um, I tried to make joyful in the book while at the same time giving it some of that bittersweet quality. And to me, that's life, right? Um, we, uh, I think it's Charlie Baxter in, in Burning Down the House who writes about how sometimes we stop at the DQ on the way to divorce court, uh, <laughs> right? So there's really great ice cream at the time your marriage is falling apart. <laughs> and and well, that's what I try to do is to try to try to see as fully as I can. And that means seeing the, the good and the bad. Well, that, that segues um, directly into my next question. And I think you've kind of answered it, um, kind of backed into it, which is, you know, there's some dark stuff in the book. You know, we're talking about your father and we're talking about, I'm thinking of the two Jennies in the chapter called Spook or in the section called Spook. But there's also wonderful humor and wonderful relationship of you and your family to the natural world. So I think what I wanna ask you about is the craft of leavening, right? Of balance, um, particularly if you're writing about something that is difficult or creates ruefulness, R-U-E, rue. So I think what I'm asking about is humor and the beauty of the natural world, how you mix that in with what's potentially a hurtful subject and how you create balance. Yeah. Yeah, there's a moment in the book when I, I write about um, my mother and father going to a basketball game at the school where my mom taught. And I wasn't able to go because I had a cold, I think, that night. But in previous visits to basketball games, I had seen uh, students selling these, um, these, well, they were pieces of styrofoam with kind of like 
um, sticks for a mast, like a like a boat, right? So you could like float these things, right? And um, for whatever reason, I thought that was what a kite was. So I told my mom before they went to the game that night that I wanted her to bring me a kite. And when they returned, she had a kite. It was a honeymooners kite from the old television show with Jackie Gleason, where he was like the man in the moon. Right. And that was the lo that was part of the logo. Yeah, right, right. And so they presented it to me. My mother and father did. And I was upset. I said, but I wanted a kite. And she said, this is a kite. And I said, no, I want a kite. And my father, who must have been amazed and wondered why I was talking in italics, <laughs> said, I'll give you something to cry about. And again, there we are with sort of the misunderstanding of language leading to humor and darkness. And so uh, that's an example of how I try to do it. I try to find the, sometimes I try to find the absurdity within the darkness or I try to find the, um, the humor um, within something negative. Um, it's just a matter I think of, oh, well, hell, it's just a matter of living long enough to understand that the world works this way. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the great joys of reading you is this, the authorial voice to be academic about it, but also um, just this really lovely flow of light and dark, bitter and sweet to paraphrase Charles Baxter, the you know Dairy Queen on the way to the divorce. It's this, um, ability you have to balance both of these things as you tell the story and you do it in your fiction and you do it in your nonfiction. Um, and it, it's what keeps me uh, on the, at the page because I see that in my own life and that's what keeps the reader there with memoir. I have two more questions. Uh, and of course, if anybody else out there in TV land or Zoom land or whatever it is, wants to throw something into the Q&A, please do, because we welcome them. Um, you and I both come from what you call in Gone the Hard Road, a house of sorrow, in which our mothers tried to create light for us in darkness. And you write that you wish your mother were alive now so that you could tell her, quote, that her efforts were not in vain. What did Beulah want for you and why are her efforts not in vain? Oh, damn it, Jessica, you're gonna get me teary-eyed here. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think my mother realized early on that I was not meant for the life of the farmer. Um, and I think that's why she was so insistent upon introducing me to books and to reading. And I think Ultimately, this was her greatest gift to me. Um, she was able to identify my talents and she was able to encourage those. Even though she must have known that one day they would take me away from her. Um, so I think that's what she wanted for me. She wanted, um, she wanted me to have the life that would be the best life for me. Um, and I do wish, um, as I'm sure we all do, we wish that those loved ones who have left us, we wish uh, there was some way to, to communicate with them again. Um, and in my case, to let her know that um, her faith in me uh, paid off in the end. Um, <clears throat> and I do have this very blessed life where I get to write and I get to teach and it's because of her. What haven't I asked you? What do you want us to think about or to know? Or what have you been waiting to say? Oh, gee, golly whiz, I don't know. Um, I really don't know, Jessica. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, uh, if anyone reads this book. A lot of people have been reading this book from what I can gather. Uh, if you read this book and if you like what you read, or if you don't like what you read, I hope you'll say so. Um, if you'll post a review on Amazon or Goodreads or wherever you do that sort of thing, 
um, it would mean a lot to me. And I, I, I honestly mean it, even if you don't like the book, it's always good to hear that too. Um, we learn as writers um, from criticism. And uh, I may be cutting my own throat here by inviting this, but I'd be happy to read uh, negative thoughts about the book as well as positive thoughts. That's very brave of you. Having read oddly negative reviews of my own work, um, you are a brave person. <laughs> well, I've, I've read enough negative reviews of my own work uh, to sort of be hardened against it, but also to really understand that sometimes the hard things that you have to hear um, are the important things that you have to hear. Mm -hmm. To And I always say that writing is a lifelong apprenticeship. So I'm always trying to learn more and more and more. Um, every book we write demands more things of us, yeah. sort of different things. Um, so yeah, yeah, let me know what you think of this. So as a writer, and we were talking about your blog and about the prompts, the prompt that was up, today's Tuesday, so I guess it was the prompt from Monday, yeah. was what? It was about scents, smells. Yeah, you know, it was about how scents take us, or how any sensory detail really, but I was concentrating on on scents because of the smell of peonies on uh -huh. Memorial Day, which we always used to call Decoration Day because you would decorate the family graves. Uh, how those sensory details can take you back in memory, uh, not just to the, the, the sensory detail itself, but also to everything around it. Um, sense of identity, um, sense of maybe class, ethnicity, uh, politics even. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, how, how relying upon those sensory details can actually start to create the narrative of a memoir. Mm -hmm. It got me thinking about it too. And then before we started today, we were talking and then Claire was talking and we were asking like, what is the scent, the smell that you are remembering and why? Yeah, so, um, so let's pose the question to the audience. And yeah. then they can, they can write me if they want to or, or put it in the chat. What, and here's what, something smelly for you. Oh, there you go. There you go. What, what, what is the scent that takes you back into your childhood? That was the question that I posed in the, mm -hmm. in the blog post yesterday. So yeah, if anyone wants to uh, check out the blog post and then leave a comment with your own scent, tell a little story if you'd like to. Um, I, I like it best when the blog creates a conversation um, so if you have something to contribute, please do. Diane Otwell says honeysuckle. Honeysuckle, it came up again. It did. Is hey, it because hey, we're in the South? I wonder. It's very popular. All the, the honeysuckles in bloom around here right now in the Midwest. Yeah. I don't know if they have it like in New England or, or Seattle. I don't know. I don't know. So um, I want to, let me just make sure I've got everybody here. Gail O'Neill says Play-Doh. Play-Doh, Play yeah. I, that was a great smell for me too. Yeah, okay, I used to eat it. So uh, <laughs> that explains a lot, right? <laughs> uh, so Lee, I wanna thank you. This has, as always, been such a pleasure. And I wanna remind everybody that our bookseller, uh, and there is a link in the chat, is Acapella Books here in Atlanta. Um, and here is Gone the Hard Road. I'm trying to not get the glare on it, as well as Lee's other books. Um, and um, we're going to welcome Claire Haley back. Jessica, I'm still laughing that you said you used to eat Play-Doh. I'm glad you're still with us. I'm pretty sure that's not, not what you're supposed to do with it. Uh, Diane, I said honeysuckle as well. So that's really- I don't really think I ingested a lot of it. I think it was pretty minimal. <laughs> Well, uh, Lee and Jessica, thank you so much. It was just such a delightful conversation. And if you haven't already read the book, it's fabulous. As Jessica said, it's available from Acapella Books. There's a link to do that in the chat. And we highly encourage you to support them instead of Amazon, though, you know what, no matter how you get the book is great. So please, please do that. And Lee, Jessica, again, thank you both so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Oh, uh, thank you, Claire. And thanks to everyone who came out for this tonight. And thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Lee. I'll see you in real life sometime. We hope. Bye. Thank you.
We're looking forward to that soon. For now, though, we're still virtual. So just two uh, upcoming talks we have that you all might be interested in. This Thursday, we're welcoming Ben Beard, and he will be in conversation with Emory Professor Matthew Bernstein on his book, The South Never Plays Itself, which is going to be a really fun talk about the differing perceptions of the South on screen uh, throughout the years in movie and TV. So it's going to be a really fun conversation. And then on Monday, June 7th, we're welcoming Annette Gordon-Reed uh, for her new book on Juneteenth, and she will be in conversation with Virginia Prescott. So all of that and more is available at atlantahistorycenter.com. And so make sure you go there and sign up. Those talks are both free, so we hope that you're able to join us. Again, Lee, Jessica, thank you so much. And to everyone else, hope you had a lovely long weekend and good night. Everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.